Summary, 5 Love Languages Singles Edition, Gary D. Chapman Book link click here The 5 love languages are words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. These are the 5 ways people express and receive love. Singles have the same emotional need to feel loved as married couples. Loved languages provide a way for singles to enhance their relationships. The book applies love languages to singles' relationships with friends, family, dating partners, and potential spouses. It guides using love languages to deepen connections in all relationships. Chapters 3 through 7 explore each of the five love languages in depth and provide examples of how to express each language to others. Chapter 8 helps readers discover their primary love language and the love languages of people they care about. Chapters 9 through 13 looks at how to apply the love languages in specific relationships, including with family, dating partners, friends, and as a single parent. The book provides practical advice and stories from singles about how understanding love languages improve their relationships. The book's overall message is that effectively loving others and feeling loved are crucial to well-being and success as a single adult. Learning to speak love languages can enhance all relationships and create greater joy and purpose. There are over 92 million single adults in the U.S., making up more than 40% of the adult population. Single adults can be categorized into five groups, never married, divorced, separated, widowed, and single parents. Despite their diversity, single adults share the common need to give and receive love. Love is central to their well-being and sense of meaning in life. The story of Rob, the man with the mental halo, illustrates the power of love to help people overcome difficult circumstances. Rob credits the love of his family and friend for giving him the hope and strength to recover from a severe accident. Most people know little about love even though it's fundamental to relationships and life. We tend to view love as something that happens rather than something we can learn and develop. By learning about the five love languages, single adults can gain insight into themselves and their relationships. They can learn to express and experience love effectively. Things to think about. How loved are you by the important people in your life? Have you had a friend's love help you through a difficult time? Have you been that kind of friend to someone else? How good are you at giving and receiving love? How interested are you in learning about the nature of love and improving your relationships? The key message is that single adults can enhance their ability to give and receive love in all their relationships by better understanding love and the five love languages. Love can transform lives, but it must be expressed and experienced to have that effect. Here's a summary. Humans are social creatures and seek relationships. Positive relationships bring happiness while negative ones bring pain. Our relationships with our parents shape how we view and pursue love. Unloving parents often motivate children to search for love elsewhere, often in misguided ways. Romantic relationships go through two main stages, the obsessive stage, lasts around two years. We see our partner through rose-tinted glasses and believe they are perfect for us. We feel euphoric and that we'll be happy forever. This stage requires little effort and is based on emotion and physical attraction. Most people get married in this stage. The covenant stage, the obsessiveness fades and we recognize our partner's flaws and other life pursuits. We must work to fuel passion and love. This stage requires effort and commitment to the relationship. Many fail to transition to this stage, which often leads to divorce. Understanding the nature of these relationship stages and learning to express love in your partner's language are critical to a successful long-term relationship. Failure to do so often results in divorce and repetition of the cycle. Words hold power and influence over us. The words we heard as children shape our personalities and behavior. For those who grew up with positive, affirming words, speaking words of affirmation comes naturally. For others, it is a foreign language they have to learn. The good news is we can all learn to speak words of affirmation and enjoy receiving them. Some people, known as encouragers, grew up speaking affirmation fluently. For others, it is a language they have to work to learn. The author introduces Brian as an example. Brian seemed to have everything going for him on the surface, but he struggled to believe in himself because of the lack of affirming words in his life. Affirming words have the power to inspire and motivate us. Lack of affirmation can lead to self-esteem, insecurity, and difficulty believing in oneself. Speaking affirmations means offering sincere compliments, encouragement, and praise. It means noticing details about others and pointing them out with care. Learning to speak this love language requires paying close attention to others so you can find specific things you genuinely appreciate about them. Saying I appreciate you means more when you say why. The key takeaway is that speaking affirmatively and offering sincere compliments and praise can significantly impact relationships and other people's self-worth and motivation. Lacking affirming words in one's life can do the opposite. 
Learning this love language requires being observant and specific in what you appreciate about others. Brian is a former football player who has been unsuccessful in relationships and dating. He requested to speak with the author to get advice. Brian's most extended relationships have only lasted three to four months. Usually the women end the relationships, citing lack of common interests or compatibility. Brian believes it's because he struggles with personal conversations. Brian had a strained relationship with his alcoholic father, who was often critical of him. His mother was depressed and not very emotionally close to him. Brian grew up hearing mostly criticism and discouraging words from his parents. When asked about his attractions to his exes Courtney and Amy, Brian cited their looks, personalities, intelligence, and spirituality. However, he couldn't recall ever complimenting or expressing appreciation for them. Brian realizes he never learned to speak the love language of words of affirmation. The author tells Brian that his relationship difficulty is likely because he never received words of affirmation from his parents, so he doesn't know how to express them to others. Girls want verbal commitment, and the lack of it is seen as a lack of love. Brian realizes the author is correct and that he has been critical of his exes just like his father was of him. He wants to know if there's hope for him to learn to give what he never received. The author tells Brian there is hope, people can change and learn new behaviors. Brian can learn to love others by expressing love, even if he didn't receive it himself. The author offers to give Brian advice on learning affirming words. The key takeaway is that Brian's unhealthy past experiences with his parents contributed to his lack of ability to express care, approval and affection in his relationships. But with conscious effort, he can overcome this by learning the skill of verbal affirmation. Brian is learning to express love through words of affirmation. He starts by calling his parents and ending conversations by saying I love you. His mom reciprocates after the first time. Brian also starts affirming co-workers once a week. He comes up with a list of proving things to say like, thanks for taking that phone call. I didn't have time to talk to him, and you handled it well. You always have such a positive attitude. I appreciate that. You did a great job with this. Thanks. Brian starts preparing to affirm things to say to future dating partners like, your eyes are beautiful. They sparkle. I like the way you relate to your mother. You treat her with respect, but you don't let her control your life. Thanks for letting me take you out tonight. I enjoyed our time together. A year later, Brian introduces his girlfriend Rachel to the author. Brian says Rachel is the best. Brian's mom reciprocates his I love you and appreciates his affirmation. She regrets not giving him more attention as a child due to depression. The story is about Brian, who worked to improve his relationships with his parents, especially his father. Initially, Brian's conversations with his parents were superficial. He decided he wanted to deepen his connection with them. Brian ended each phone call with his mother by telling her one thing he appreciated about her and why. At first, his mother asked for forgiveness for not being a better parent. Brian assured her she did many good things, making their conversations more meaningful. Brian told him I love you during calls with his father, but his father's responses were initially awkward. After a few months, his father said, I love you too. Brian expressed appreciation for the things his father did for him. His father apologized for not being more involved in Brian's life, Brian forgave him, and their relationship improved. Brian learned the importance of using words to affirm others. There are different ways to do this, words of encouragement, inspiring courage in others and motivating them. For example, encouraging a friend's dream or goal. Words of praise, recognizing someone's accomplishments, such as raising a friend to finish a complex project. Kind words, speaking to others in a caring tone and manner. For example, using a gentle voice to express emotion. The way you say something is as important as what you say. Forgiveness, letting go of past hurts and failures and forgiving others when they apologize instead of seeking revenge. This allows for reconciliation and better relationships. Brian used these methods to reconnect with his parents in a meaningful way. His story shows how powerful expressing affirmation and forgiveness can be. Here's a summary, releasing someone who persists in wrong behavior is not forgiveness. It is choosing not to be consumed by hurt and anger, while still loving them. It allows one to live in peace. Words have power and influence relationships. Using affirming words can enhance relationships, while harsh words can destroy them. Choosing to love others means using establishing the language. Receiving gifts is one way some people feel loved. The right gift, big or small, communicates emotional love. Gifts given to manipulate or smooth over problems are not true gifts. Meaningful gifts are symbols of love. Learning to give good gifts requires effort for those not naturally inclined. It means listening to learn interests and needs, making notes of ideas, 
and choosing gifts that fit the person. However, some facilities may not be well received depending on the relationship or values, so sensitivity is essential. An example is a man whose expensive gift was rejected by the woman he had been dating for three months. The likely reason is that they had different ideas of the level of commitment in the relationship, so the gift seemed too much. The solution is to have an open conversation about the relationship and gift giving to clarify expectations. The key points are that love requires choice and effort, communication is critical, and we must be sensitive to the other person's perspective. Open, honest conversation helps ensure gifts are given and received well. Here's a summary. Josh loved Samantha profoundly and wanted to express it by giving her an expensive gift. However, Samantha does not feel as deeply for Josh yet and is uncomfortable accepting such an extravagant gift. She thinks it's too early in the relationship. I advise Josh that he cannot force Samantha to accept expressions of love she's not ready for. He needs to respect her feelings and give the relationship more time. In general, the purpose of gifts is to communicate love emotionally. But people have different attitudes about money that affect their gift giving. Savers may refrain from spending on gifts. They need to see that giving gifts is investing in relationships. Single parents especially need to be careful about giving gifts. Gifts should enhance the child's well-being, not just be shown because the child begs for them. And counterfeit gifts given to make up for lack of genuine love and involvement are not healthy. For some people, receiving gifts is their primary love language. Gifts make them feel most loved. Even small, Thoughtful gifts can fill their love tank on special occasions and at any time. The story of Bridget and her teddy bears illustrates this. The bears were gifts that communicated love to her over the years. Even though sleeping with 50 bears seemed strange to Chris, the bears had deep emotional significance for Bridget. Gifts are her primary love language. The main points in this section are, acts of service are one of the primary love languages. When Jenny's co-worker Beth helped her and was patient in teaching her new skills, Jenny felt loved. Acts of service speak volumes. Even the famous scientist Albert Einstein recognized that love and service are more powerful than science. He replaced portraits of scientists with those of humanitarians like Schweitzer and Gandhi. Jesus demonstrated acts of service by washing his disciples' feet. He taught that those who are great serve others. The Apostle Paul said to serve one another in love. Truly successful people in all vocations, whether physicians, leaders, or educators, serve others. Service to others is an aspiration. Service is different from slavery. Slavery is forced and creates resentment, whereas service is done out of love and care. The divorced single woman quoted served her husband for 20 years but felt unloved and unappreciated. She no longer wanted to live with him as a result. Doing things for your spouse or partner like making them coffee, giving a back rub, or picking up the dry cleaning can be acts of service that show you care. But these must be done freely and not out of obligation. Absolute service flows out of love. Paying attention to the everyday details of your loved one's lives and helping out speaks volumes. Actual acts of service do not require fanfare but are done quietly and lovingly. In summary, acts of service require a loving heart and a desire to meet the real needs of another. They are unlimited in scope but are small details attended to every day. Accurate service never enslaves but always liberates and brings joy. The person has performed many acts of service over 20 years, but not out of love. The shows were done out of fear, guilt, and resentment. Treating someone as a doormat precludes the possibility of a loving relationship. Manipulation and coercion are not expressions of love. True acts of service are freely given out of choice and a desire to express love, not done out of obligation or manipulation. The story illustrates how acts of service can be a meaningful way to express love in a relationship. The man performed many kind and helpful acts for the woman, though she did not yet have romantic feelings for him. Acts of service do not come naturally to everyone. Some people grow up learning to be self-sufficient and see acts of kindness as implying the other person can't do things themselves. But acts of kindness are a way to express love and concern for others. Before doing acts of service for someone, it is best to ask if they would find it helpful. What is meant as an act of love may be misinterpreted by someone not receptive to that love language. The story shows how the man's many acts of kindness and service made the woman feel he was beautiful even though she did not yet feel romantic attraction. Acts of service can be a powerful way to express love and build closeness. Mike is frustrated in his relationship with Jenna because she is rarely available to spend time together due to her demanding work schedule. Quality time refers to focused, undivided attention given to another person. It is about togetherness and connecting with someone. Humans have a fundamental need to connect with other people. We need quality time to feel genuinely connected, even around others. 
Quality time is a powerful way to express love and meet emotional needs. Examples of quality time include, a single mom playing with her toddler a husband and wife going for a walk together after dinner without distractions two friends meeting for coffee and conversing without constantly checking their phones and relationships. Quality time helps to build intimacy, enhance communication, reduce loneliness, and meet the human need for interaction and togetherness. To give quality time, make eye contact, listen actively without distraction, be fully present in the moment, and engage in a two-way conversation. Quality time should be given regularly and consistently. Does this summary accurately reflect the passage's key ideas and examples regarding quality time? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The quality time together, however brief, allows the mother and child to connect emotionally. Their focus is on each other, and this focused attention and togetherness is what matters. If the mother's attention is divided, the child needs her full attention and connection when she is talking on the phone. Quality time does not require constant eye contact or engaging in an activity together. It means giving each other your undivided attention and being emotionally present. The action is secondary to the sense of bonding or togetherness created. A dating couple's emotional connection and enjoyment of each other's company are more important than the activity itself. If one partner gives the other tennis lessons, the focus is on developing skills rather than quality time together. However, they can still experience quality time together by talking over lemonade after the class. The conversation is one form of quality time. It requires listening to share experiences, thoughts and feelings in an uninterrupted, focused way. Unlike words of affirmation, the quality conversation focuses on listening to understand the other person. Asking questions shows you are listening and caring about the other person. Many people need more communication skills for quality conversation. It requires getting in touch with your experiences, emotions, thoughts, and desires and learning to express them to yourself and others. This re-socialization process takes conscious effort and time. Quality listening is equally important. Poor listeners only listen long enough to get the topic and then share their thoughts, without really understanding the other person. They are quick to give advice or solutions instead of empathy and support. Becoming a good listener requires the following. Maintaining eye contact to show you are fully engaged avoiding distractions and giving the speaker your undivided attention listening for the feelings and emotions behind the words observing body language for additional clues to the speaker's feelings refraining from interrupting the speaker asking clarifying questions to make sure you understand the speaker's thoughts and feelings with conscious effort and practice. People can become better listeners and experience the quality conversation that is so meaningful to those whose primary love language is quality time. Physical touch is a fundamental love language for many people. Infants and older people thrive on physical affection and touching. Many single adults crave physical touch and affection but hesitate to express this need due to fear of misinterpretation. The human body is designed to receive and perceive touch through tactile receptors located throughout the body. These receptors send signals to the brain, interpreting the communications as painful, pleasant, loving, or hostile. Some areas of the body, like fingertips and lips, have many tactile receptors and are very sensitive to touch. Other regions like shoulders have fewer receptors and are less sensitive. For those whose primary love language is physical touch, appropriate affectionate touching, and hugs communicate caring, warmth, and affirmation. Some examples of touching to meet this need include, hugging holding hands kisses back rubs massages gentle squeezes playfully poking slash tickling brushing a hand against the other's face sitting close enough to touch. Learning to speak the love language of physical touch may require overcoming barriers related to upbringing, past experiences, and natural reserve. But with time and conscious effort, speaking this love language can become more realistic and fulfill a deep emotional need. Does this summary accurately reflect the key ideas and main points around the love language of physical touch? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any part of this summary. Physical touch is psychologically essential and can make or break a relationship. It communicates love or hate. For those whose primary love language is physical touch, touches speak louder than words. Withholding touches can raise doubts about love and isolate someone. Physical abuse is inappropriate and harmful. Depending on context and relationship, appropriate and inappropriate ways to touch others exist. Inappropriate touches can be seen as harassment. Touches can be implicit, subtle, quick, or explicit, demanding attention like a massage. Implicit touches show love in little time but require thought. Clear communications require time, effort and understanding how to communicate love. Physical touch in times of crisis can be very comforting and help one feel loved. For some, hugs and touches from close ones can fill their love tank and help them through difficult times. However, not all respond positively to physical contact. 
it's important to recognize others' primary love languages. Physical touch cannot be discussed without considering human sexuality and cultural views. Freud emphasized satisfying instinctual desires but later thinkers argue this does not guarantee happiness or sanity. Unrestrained sexuality has been linked to societal problems. Research shows cohabitation before marriage is linked to higher divorce rates. Cohabiting couples tend to have lower relationship quality, stability and more disagreements. Though popularly seen as a biological need like hunger or thirst, we believe sex should be intimate and shared with a committed partner. Most see infidelity in cohabiting or marital relationships as a violation. Married men are more faithful to partners than cohabiting men. There is a quest for meaning in human sexuality beyond mere fulfillment of desires. Sex within lifelong monogamous marriage is seen as the healthiest and most productive domain by researchers. Cohabiting women are eight times more likely to be unfaithful than married women. There are reasons why major world religions value sexuality within marriage. Research shows the benefits of reserving sex for long-term commitments. This choice affects health and satisfaction. There are appropriate ways to express physical touch with the same or opposite sex. This language is about emotional love, not sexuality. Some people have trouble with physical touch due to past abuse or upbringing. Counseling and learning can help. Speaking a new love language requires effort. A woman learned to get more comfortable hugging her partner by embracing her parents. Consistent effort pays off. Timing, setting, and manner are essential for appropriate physical touch. Look for cues that someone is open to touch. Communication is usually inappropriate when someone is angry or wants space. Celebrate victories and support setbacks. The setting and kind of touch matter. Forcing unwanted touch is selfish. There are many ways to express affection through appropriate touch. The specific communications and manner you do them depend on the other person. Be sensitive to their desires. Everyone expresses and receives love in different ways. It is essential to learn how your partner best receives love. Forcing your preferred expressions of love onto someone else can be off-putting and damage the relationship. You must learn to speak the other person's love language. Physical touch is one way people express love, but not everyone enjoys or desires the same types of communication. Some like hugs, others don't. It is critical to understand your partner's preferences. Inappropriate or abusive touch is highly damaging. Physical and sexual abuse have no place in a loving relationship. To discover your primary love language, observe how you naturally express love to others. How you say, love is likely how you wish to receive love. However, for about 25% of people their preferred method to receive love differs from how they express it. The five love languages are, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. Most people have a primary love language that speaks to them most sincerely. Those who struggle to determine their primary love language may have always felt loved and received all five languages from their parents or may have never felt truly loved. Self-reflection and observation of your behavior can help determine your primary love language. Speaking in your partner's love language and having them speak in yours leads to greater feelings of being loved and relationship satisfaction. Loved languages are a powerful tool for enhancing intimacy. Does this summary cover the main points of the explanation on love languages? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. To discover someone else's primary love language, observe their expressions of love to others. Do they hug, give gifts, offer words of affirmation, spend quality time, or do acts of service? The way they express love to others is likely their love language. Complaints, what do they complain about the most? Lack of hugs or gifts? Lack of quality time or words of affirmation? Their complaints point to their love language. Requests. What do they ask for the most? Hugs, gifts, quality time, words of affirmation, acts of service? Their requests reveal their love language. As Margot did with her mom, you can ask them questions to discover their love language. Margot asked what her mom would like for her birthday, and her mom requested spending a day together, revealing her love language as quality time. Helen's story shows that learning someone's love language helps you know what gifts or expressions of love will be meaningful to them. Her friend received words of affirmation as gifts, but that would not have been meaningful to Helen, whose loved language was acts of service. The point is that we all have a primary way to feel loved and express love to others. Learning to identify the love languages of friends and loved ones allows us to be much more effective in loving them in a way they will appreciate. Loving people how they need to be loved creates healthy, long-lasting relationships. Here's a summary. Many people did not grow up in ideal homes where parents spoke each other's and their children's love languages. As a result, they did not always feel loved, 
even though they knew intellectually that their parents loved them. It's essential for adults to take responsibility for enhancing relationships with their parents. Love can overcome difficulties and barriers. Love is seeking the other's well-being, expressed through meaningful behaviors. When we feel loved, we naturally honor and esteem those who love us. Mutual love and honor between parents and children lead to greater well-being and longevity. No parental relationship is hopeless. Taking the initiative to learn and speak your parents' love languages and speak them can heal relationships. Love often stimulates reciprocation, diminishing negative feelings. Though reciprocation isn't guaranteed, it often happens even in complex relationships. Speaking your parents' love languages can help you feel loved by them and enhance your bond. The commandment to honor one's parents comes with the promise of well-being and long life. Positive relationships with parents have significant benefits. Some key takeaways, make the effort to express love to your parents, even if you have a troubled relationship. Love can change dynamics. Discover your parents' primary love languages and speak them regularly. This can elicit feelings of being loved and cared for in return. Work on your attitude, choosing to seek their well-being. Then express that attitude through loving behaviors, regardless of your emotions. Wait to see if they reciprocate before giving up. Reciprocation is often a process that takes time. With consistent love, you may find the relationship transforming. Commit to enhancing the relationship as a gift to yourself and your parents. The rewards of mutual love and honor are well worth the effort. Does this help summarize the critical points about applying the five love languages to relationships with parents? Let me know if you have any other questions. Here is a summary of the story. Jennifer was adopted as a baby by George and Martha. They provided her with a loving home for 13 years. At 14, Jennifer wanted to meet her birth mother, Christina. Her adoptive parents opposed this due to Christina's troubled past. At 16, Jennifer located Christina and began secretly meeting her. After a year, her adoptive parents found out and were upset. The following years were troubled. In college, Jennifer maintained relationships with both families but hid contacts with Christina from her adoptive parents. During college, Christina had troubles and went to rehab. Jennifer felt abandoned and got counseling. She came to understand both families loved her in their way. Jennifer read the five love languages and realized her love language was words of affirmation. She determined her adoptive parents' languages were acts of service, Martha, and words of affirmation, George. Christina's was physical touch. Jennifer began speaking each family member's love language, and her relationships with all of them improved. She felt more loved and affirmed. The story shows that discovering family members' love languages and speaking them can heal relationships, even after hurts and struggles. This can work for siblings and parents. An example is given of Brianna, whose brother always called her freckles. Though annoying, she realized speaking his love language could help. The point is, loved languages can reconcile relationships. The critical takeaway is that initiating expressions of love in family members' primary love languages can heal relationships, enhance good ones, and help resolve past hurts. Here's a summary, Brianna and her brother have a good relationship overall, but Brianna doesn't like that her brother still calls her freckles in public even though she asked him to stop years ago. Brianna's primary love language is words of affirmation while her brother's is quality time. They express love for each other through these means. A counselor suggests Brianna tell her brother how much she loves him on a scale of 0 to 10, then ask him how much he loves her. When he responds positively, she should request again that he stop calling her freckles in public. She does this, and he agrees to quit. Steve and his brother Tom have always had a contentious relationship. Steve wants to improve it, especially since their parents are aging. The counselor suggests Steve figure out Tom's primary love language and speak to him through that. Steve gives Tom a book on love languages. Tom's wife tells Steve that Tom's primary love language is acts of service. Steve offers to watch Tom's dog when Tom and his wife leave for the weekend. Tom accepts, and Steve begins helping Tom with more acts of service like yard work, home repairs, gardening, etc. This fills Tom's love tank and improves their relationship. The key idea is that speaking to someone in their primary love language can help improve the relationship, even if it has been troubled in the past. Making sincere efforts to express love and meet their needs goes a long way. Here is a summary of the passage. Dating is a common practice in Western culture but not a universal human practice. Some cultures prohibit casual dating between young men and women. Dating has several purposes. It helps individuals develop wholesome interactions with the opposite sex. Learning to relate to the opposite sex is an important life skill. However, many people view the opposite sex as sex objects rather than as fellow humans. 
It allows individuals to learn about another person's name, personality, and values. This helps combat the tendency to see others as objects rather than complex individuals. It helps individuals gain self-awareness by seeing their strengths, weaknesses, and areas for growth. Interacting with a dating partner highlights the positive and negative parts of one's personality. The passage gives the example of Abby, who started dating later but found it helped combat loneliness and isolation. The course also provides the example of the overly talkative man who realized how obnoxious his behavior seemed when dating a woman who talked constantly. In summary, dating has significant benefits when approached with the right mindset and objectives. It can help cultivate relationships between men and women, promote personal growth, and gain self-awareness. However, it requires overcoming the tendency to view the opposite sex as objects rather than fellow humans. After dating Sally, his eyes were open to his weaknesses and immaturity. He realized he needed to curb his speech, develop his listening skills, and be slow to anger. Change is hard but necessary for growth. Abby got counseling to overcome her shyness and push herself to socialize more. Dating provides opportunities to serve others. We should focus on the other person's needs and growth, not just our interests. Dating helps us discover the kind of person we might want to marry based on compatibility and shared values. Learning to speak your partner's love language enhances dating relationships. The excitement of new relationships fades over time. Long-term relationships require intentional effort. Shelley and Neil's initial attraction was no longer enough, so they had to work on maintaining intimacy. In summary, dating should foster personal growth, opportunities to serve others, compatibility for marriage, and long-term intimacy, not just short-term excitement. Relationships can transition from infatuation to long-term love and commitment with self-awareness, effort, and compromise. Mark called to announce he was getting married to Sylvia, a woman he had been dating for three years. They were older, had been married before, and didn't feel the need for premarital counseling. Two years into the marriage, Mark called again saying they were having severe disagreements and weren't happy. After counseling them for three months, it was clear their love tanks were empty and they didn't feel loved by each other. The in-love feeling had worn off before they married, but they had so much in common they didn't see it as an issue. Their differences started causing problems once they married. Lack of emotional love led to tension and frustration. Sylvia's love language was quality time. Before marriage, Mark spoke it by giving her his full attention, but after marriage he was too busy and distracted. Sylvia felt neglected. Mark's love language was words of affirmation. But Sylvia was stingy with compliments and rarely affirmed him. Mark felt unloved. They had to choose to love each other by speaking their love language. Love was now a choice, not just a feeling. Once they started speaking each other's love language, the emotional climate improved, and conflicts became less frequent and more easily resolved. They felt loved and happy again. The key message is that the feeling of falling in love or infatuation wears off, but love can still grow when couples express love in the way their partner needs. Speaking each other's love language and meeting emotional needs leads to a long, happy marriage. Love becomes a choice, not just a feeling. With time and effort, Mark and Sylvia could make that choice and turn their marriage around. Mark and Sylvia's marriage was in trouble because they did not understand each other's love languages and needs. Mark's love language was words of affirmation, while Sylvia's was quality time. Mark gave Sylvia his full attention during dating, and she felt loved. After marriage, Mark was always busy with tasks and projects and did not spend quality time with Sylvia. As a result, Sylvia's love tank was empty and she became critical of Mark. Mark felt unloved and hurt by Sylvia's criticism. They read the five love languages and realize their mistakes. Mark promised to spend date nights and quality time with Sylvia. Sylvia pledged to express her appreciation for Mark. Their marriage improved as a result. The story illustrates that it is essential to understand your partner's love language and continue expressing love after marriage. Romantic love during dating is temporary, while purposeful love requires effort. Most people desire a happy, lifelong marriage. However, there are fears and uncertainties about whether this is possible. Understanding the nature of love and how to express it can help build a successful marriage. Marriage has many reasons, including companionship, sex, love, having children, social acceptance, finances, and security. However, the most profound purpose of marriage is the union of two lives at all levels. Marriage is meant to satisfy the human need for deep connection and become one flesh. Getting married does not create this kind of union. Couples must have reasons to believe they can achieve oneness across all areas of life, intellectual, social, emotional, spiritual, and physical. They must share fundamental values, interests, and goals to build a lasting marriage. Before marriage, 
couples should explore foundational areas of unity to build a strong foundation for their relationship. These areas include, intellectual, discuss interests like books, articles, websites you frequent. See if you share enough interests to connect and grow together. Social, discuss social interests like music, sports, parties, and hobbies. Look for shared interests and be willing to participate in each other's goods. Personality clashes won't resolve after marriage. Emotional, feel loved, respected, and appreciated. Speak each other's love languages. Respect each other's personhood, ideas, and emotions. Express appreciation for each other's contributions and efforts. Spiritual, discuss core beliefs about God, faith and spiritual growth. Pray together. Attend church together and discuss the experience. Spiritual unity is critical but often neglected. In summary, build foundations of unity across intellectual, social, emotional, and spiritual areas. Discuss specifics to determine shared and divergent interests. Look for the ability to connect, grow, and meet each other's needs. Compromise and sacrificing some independence will be required. But strong foundations lead to successful lifelong relationships. The key messages are, Build strong foundations before marriage by exploring potential unity and disconnect areas. Discuss specifics in intellectual, social, emotional and spiritual realms to determine shared and diverging interests. Look for ability and willingness to connect, grow, and meet each other's needs. Compromise will be required. Strong foundations of unity lead to successful lifelong relationships. Weak foundations lead to disappointment and distance. Many couples neglect spiritual unity vital to a meaningful relationship. Discuss core beliefs, pray together and share experiences of faith. Express love, respect, and appreciation and speak each other's love languages to develop emotional intimacy. Does this summary accurately reflect the key highlights and messages from the passage? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The passage discusses the importance of understanding people's love languages, even in non-romantic relationships. The example cited is of two college roommates, Reed and Brad who have very different living habits and preferences. Reed is organized and disciplined, while Brad is messy and undisciplined. Though they like each other as people, Reed finds Brad's clutter and messiness frustrating. The advice given to Reed is that while we can't force people to change, we can influence them through love and understanding them. Reed is reminded of the five love languages, words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. While these are often applied to romantic relationships, they are also relevant in relationships like friendships or roommate relationships. By understanding Brad's love language and communicating with him in that language, Reed would have a better chance of influencing him to be neater without confrontation. For example, if Brad's love language is words of affirmation, Reed could express appreciation when Brad does pick up after himself. If it's quality time, engaging Brad in meaningful conversations could make him more open to listening to Reed's perspective. Learning Brad's love language and communicating and caring for him in that language is the best way for Reed to improve their roommate relationship. The key takeaway is that the five love languages apply to all relationships, not just romantic ones. Understanding someone else's love language and using it to communicate with them can positively influence them and improve the relationship. While we often can't force change in others, love and understanding can be very influential. The author emphasizes the importance of expressing love and affirming others to build healthy human relationships. Specifically, the story highlights the value of speaking someone's primary love language. Krista and Molly have been friends since high school. Their senior year, Molly's boyfriend Joe dies in a car accident shortly before graduation. Molly is devastated. Krista spends the summer with Molly, listening to, crying, and comforting her. Krista goes off to college while Molly stays behind to work. Krista takes a class on human relationships and learns about the five love languages. She realizes Molly's primary love languages are quality time and physical touch. Krista tries to speak Molly's love languages by visiting Molly every other weekend. This helps Molly heal, and she enrolls in college in January. The two remain friends for years, though living in separate cities. They try to call each other regularly and get together once a year. Years later, Krista tells Molly she fears her husband Randy is having an affair. Molly is there for Krista like Krista was there for her years before and after Joe's death. Molly speaks Krista's love languages and helps her work through this difficult time. The story shows how understanding someone's love languages and speaking them can strengthen bonds through complex life events. Krista and Molly's friendship endures for decades thanks to this. Krista's boyfriend Randy left her after six months. Krista was devastated. Molly and her husband Seth wanted to help Krista. 
they knew Krista's primary love language was acts of service. Molly and Seth invited Krista to stay with them. They helped her find a place to live and a job. They supported her through the pain of the breakup and helped her heal. True friends are there for each other, especially when times are tough. Understanding someone's love language allows you to support them most effectively. While technology has allowed us to connect with more people, real friendships require work. Marcy's love language is an act of service. She finds joy in serving others through volunteering. Kelly's sister was a single mom struggling financially. Kelly gave her sister new shoes and dresses to show she cared. Even though we each have a primary love language, we can still receive love in all five languages. Speaking someone's love language at work can build better relationships. Susan gave small gifts to her 19-year-old coworker Kathy, whose love language was gifted. When Kathy's fiancé broke up with her, Susan gave Kathy a gift basket to show she cared. Lauren had resented her coworker Becky but wanted a better relationship. Lauren prayed for guidance and realized Becky's love language was words of affirmation. Lauren told Becky she wanted to do one thing to make Becky's life easier as a New Year's resolution. Becky agreed if Lauren also shared one thing Becky could do for her. Lauren asked if Becky could take turns making the office coffee. Becky decided, happy to help. Becky then shared that she felt her work was taken for granted and would appreciate more verbal appreciation. Lauren and Becky built a better understanding through this experience. Angie is a single mom of two teenagers, Josh and Julie. She struggles with guilt over being unable to spend as much time with them as she would like due to her job. Now that they are teenagers, she worries she may not be equipped to handle this stage. It's common for single parents to feel overwhelmed and alone at times. Discovering your child's primary love language and speaking it can help meet their emotional needs even when you have limited time. Telling the other love languages also provides a more well-rounded experience of love for the child. A child's perception of the relationship with their parent or parents may differ from the parent's perception. For example, a father may feel he spent quality time with his child during a visit, but the child still feels unloved because the father didn't speak his primary love language, words of affirmation. The same could be valid for a primary caregiver. The main question is not whether you as a single parent love your child, but whether your child feels loved. Speaking your child's primary love language is vital in helping them feel loved. The five love languages for children are, words of affirmation, expressing affection through verbal compliments, encouragement, and praise. Harsh or critical words can be very damaging. Gifts, simple gifts to show you're thinking of them. Doesn't have to be expensive. Make the gift meaningful. Quality time, giving your child your undivided attention. Engage in conversations and express interest in their lives. Make eye contact, and share experiences together. Acts of service, doing things for your child to make their life easier or happier. They are offering to help them with chores or tasks. Actions speak loudly. Physical touch, appropriate hugs, kisses, pats on the back, holding hands, etc. Physical contact should be based on your child's needs and your relationship. The summary outlines Angie's situation as a single parent, the importance of speaking your child's primary love language to meet their emotional needs, an overview of the five love languages, and specific examples for applying them to your child. Please let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. Gifts are given out of love, not because a child deserves them or as payment for chores. Gifts should be freely given to show love. Each child has a primary love language that speaks to them most deeply, words of affirmation, quality time receiving gifts, acts of service, or physical touch. Discovering each child's primary love language and speaking it regularly is essential to keep their love tank full. Observe how your child expresses love to you to discover their love language. Also, listen to the requests and complaints they make most often. Or you can experiment by focusing on one love language each week to see how your child responds. Speaking your child's primary love language, especially before disciplining them, will help ensure they receive your love and respond better to discipline. Make sure to express additional love after punishing them as well. While a full love tank won't eliminate misbehavior, children are less likely to misbehave when their love tank is full. Discipline is given when a child's empty love tank will likely cause them to rebel. Wrap discipline in love by speaking your child's primary love language before and after disciplining them. This helps them receive the field more positively. The key to success in any area of life is learning to love people effectively. Business success is built on relationships and treating your customers well. The same is valid for success with coworkers. Lauren resented her coworker Becky for not pulling her weight at work. But Lauren decided to try expressing love to Becky in her love language, words of affirmation, as a New Year's resolution. Lauren started by thanking Becky for helping make coffee every other week. 
Becky was surprised but appreciative, and offered to satisfy Lauren differently. Lauren struggled to give Becky compliments at first, given her resentment. But she noticed Becky's new hairstyle and complimented her on it. Becky appreciated it, saying she had wanted to do something new for a long time. A couple days later, Lauren thanked Becky again for staying late at the office to get work done. Becky explained she was trying to get ahead to make up for lost time. Lauren realized Becky did care about her work and co-workers. Lauren's attitude toward Becky began to change. She made more of an effort to express appreciation and encouragement. In turn, Becky became friendlier and more helpful. Lauren realized that her resentment had been misplaced, and that showing love to Becky made a massive difference in their working relationship. The story shows how discovering someone's love language and choosing to speak it can completely transform a relationship. Expressing love and meeting emotional needs softens hearts and fosters cooperation. With effort and time, resentment can turn into friendship. The passage describes two co-workers, Lauren and Becky, who do not have a good relationship. Lauren decides to start complimenting Becky and expressing appreciation for her work. At first, Becky is surprised but responds positively. Over time, Lauren continues to affirm Becky and ask for small favors. Eventually, they become friends and even start going out for lunch together. The key lessons are, acting with love and kindness can change relationships even when you don't feel like it. Lauren complimented and expressed appreciation for Becky even though she initially didn't like her. Love is a choice and a way of behaving, not just a feeling. Lauren had to go against her initial feelings toward Becky to build a better relationship. Speaking the other person's love language in this case, words of affirmation for Becky, effectively improves a relationship. Lauren's compliments and expressions of appreciation resonated with Becky. Relationships take work, but the rewards are worth it. Improving her relationship with Becky took effort from Lauren, but it transformed the dynamics of their whole office. Love leads to success. Lauren's choice to love and invest in her relationship with Becky led to a successful friendship and a better work environment. The key takeaway is that we can improve our relationships through love, kindness, and understanding others. It may require going against our initial feelings, but the rewards of better relationships and a more positive environment around us can be significant. Acting with love and speaking others' love languages are potent ways to do this. Book link click here.